1787, he sent a French naturalist the skin, bones, and skeleton of a moose, along with regrets that the creature had lost so much hair on its transatlantic voyage. Thomas Jefferson never traveled beyond the Blue Ridge Mountains. Remarkable for this man we associate with the West and Western expansion. Uh, he could see uh, tantalizing the, those mountains from Monticello, but he never penetrated them. Uh, and he is a man, in some ways, one key, I think, to understanding Jefferson is he's not just bookish. It, you know, lots of, lots of people love to read. Jefferson lived in his books in ways that sometimes uh, gives his writings a certain kind of artificiality uh, or cloistered uh, sense. For example, from the books in his library at Monticello, he gathered that the Trans-Mississippi region was filled with active volcanoes, salt mountains a mile long, prehistoric animals, and blue-eyed Indians who spoke Welsh. <laughs> To test such reports, he had long dreamed of sending explorers up the Mississippi to the Missouri, and then west to what were then called the Stony, not Rocky, mountains, and down some westward flowing river to the Pacific. Jefferson announced the deal on July 4th, brilliant packaging, July 4th, 1803, the 26th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence. The very next day, Meriwether Lewis left Washington for Pittsburgh, and the first stage of his epic journey. With a budget of $2,500 cadged from Congress, including $695 for Indian presents, the 44-man Corps of Discovery, led by Lewis and Clark, would spend the next 28 months exploring the trackless west. Along the way, they would encounter countless plant and animal species unknown to Easterners, as well as Native Americans for whom the Great Plains, Rocky Mountains, and Pacific Northwest were not virgin territory awaiting discovery, but their homeland. Buying Louisiana violated Jefferson's strict constructionist principles. Sending Lewis and Clark on their uh, voyage of discovery uh, did likewise. Uh, in both cases, Jefferson's constitutional principles were trumped by his insatiable curiosity. However, that is not the case for his other violation of, of strict constructionism. In his second term, it's amazing, you know, Jefferson's on Mount Rushmore. Uh, we all can quote something from Jefferson. Uh, he's in the national attic, intellectual and otherwise. Um, and yet, his second term was a disaster. Very few people would disagree with that. I remember, he'd cut the army, he'd cut the navy. Um, he, he left the country almost defenseless. And um, when the European war threatened to engulf uh, the United States, um, the weapons he chose to fight with were economic. And they turned out very much to be a double-edged sword. Um, on his own, he imposed uh, the embargo which in effect said, we will not do business with the warring powers in Europe. Now, not for the, first, not for the last time, this exaggerated the uh, necessity that Europe had for American goods. It wound up, in fact, hurting Americans, and particularly New Englanders, because after all, they were the maritime economy. Thousands of sailors were thrown out of work and all of the industries. The ripple effect was enormous. And in fact, it began talk of secession uh, within New England that would reach a, a climax uh, during the, uh, the War of 1812. Well, of course, the embargo, uh, humans being human, they're very ingenious, and they found all sorts of ways to get around Jefferson's embargo. And, uh, and that forced the president to become more and more um, strict, uh, if you will, uh, overreaching, uh, if you will, in trying to enforce the embargo. So it's a great irony that this man who took office in 1801 uh, proclaiming the best government is the least government should find himself before he left office uh, eager to leave office uh, enforcing uh, a breathtaking assertion of executive authority, the sort that, that Washington and Adams uh, 
um, would never have, uh, have, have countenanced. Uh, and the, the good news for him was that he was uh, to be succeeded by his, his good friend and neighbor and intellectual soulmate, James Madison. Now, we think of Madison today, if we think of him at all, uh, we tend to associate him with the national humiliation uh, in 1814 of having our national capital, in effect, burned to the ground. Um, the fact that Madison wasn't there when the British arrived, the fact that the British were able to get there in the first place, um, and I, in many ways it stained his, his reputation. Um, it's very interesting because one of the things we've been talking about all week is how presidential reputations evolve, how um, with no new information we have new perspective based upon intervening events and, uh, if you will, new conventional thinking. It's a very interesting thing. If you look at how James Madison fought the War of 1812, first of all, the conventional notion is he didn't want to fight it, but he was too weak to prevent the war hawks, the people like Henry Clay and others, um, who confidently believed that in the first weeks of the war we would take Canada and um, we would thrash the British. Well, needless to say, uh, neither eventuality prevailed. Uh, nevertheless, Madison is blamed for not preventing uh, this war, which was largely over you know, the, the fact that the British were impressing U.S. sailors and, um, and, and that they were imposing their own commercial restrictions on, uh, on the, in the United States. It was, in effect, a second revolution. It was a second war for independence. Had we lost the War of 1812, uh, there is some question as to uh, whether the United States would have survived. Um, the other thing that Madison suffers from in, in many ways in, in, um, in posterity as in life was by comparison with his wife. Um, everyone knows Dolly Madison. Um, she's colorful, vivacious, uh, a great hostess. Uh, the old wives' tale is that she introduced ice cream uh, to the United States, for which she, we'd all be grateful. Um, and, um, and of course, we all know what she did. She was, she stayed behind in the White House as the British, having defeated a ragtag American army at Bladensburg, marched into Washington. Um, just one step ahead of them really was the first lady who stayed behind to famously cut the portrait of George Washington from its frame in the East Room, roll it up, uh, along with a few other items, and uh, and basically get out of town just ahead of the uh, arriving British. Um, so we think of Dolly as, as as displaying the heroism on that occasion, and she didn't know where her husband was. Um, the fact is, he had tried to rally um, uh, the American troops outside Washington for uh, some kind of defense. Um, now. Madison was a strict constructionist, and he fought a war on strict constructionist lines. That is to say, he's the only American president to fight a war along strict constructionist lines. What does that mean? Well, he feared domestic taxes almost as much as the red-coated enemy. So he floated $80 million in government bonds to pay for the nation's defense. He privatized the war at sea, uh, promising the spoils of victory to individual captains who took it upon themselves to attack British vessels. Um, it's almost as if the war in Iraq were to be subcontracted to Bill Gates or Warren Buffett. And on the one hand, you have the humiliations of the early, I mean, the, you know, we had a lot of lousy generals, old generals left over from the revolution. And Madison was blamed, as any president would be blamed, for the series of military defeats, culminating, of course, in the burning, the sacking of Washington. On the other hand, uh, the American Navy turned out to be surprisingly effective on the Great Lakes and Lake Champlain. And all those privateers, all those greedy individual captains, uh, turned out to do a number on the, the greatest Navy in the world. 